Hello, everyone. I'm happy to introduce Mike, uh, Michael Borkegaard. Uh, he was known as the, uh, the second generation uh, maintainer of Plots.jl. And then from there, he's found a new project, this EcoJulia. So he's here to tell us about his new organization. Thank you, Chris. Yes, as I was going to start by saying, EcoJulia is not a wonderfully mature, excellent project like BioJulia. It's something a little bit more nascent, something we are hoping to get running. Um, we've been working on it for about a year, but you know academic lives. So um, first, who am I? I'm an assistant professor at something called the Center for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate. And so obviously I work with this macroecology thing, and I work in particular with what we call dynamic island biogeography, so the evolution of life on islands, and especially how that that evolution of life is affected by the life cycle of the island, the geological life of the island. But also large-scale diversity patterns, bird evolution, all these things is, is things that I'm very interested in. So macroecology or spatial ecology is, is essentially, it's a branch of ecology that focuses on what you can say large-scale or very meta questions. It's things like what controls variation in species diversity? Where has species origination over time been most intense? If we look at the warmer areas of the globe, do they have more potential for competition among species? What are the climatic constraints on the distribution of a species, things like that. So the, what really uh, characterizes this is that we are trying to compare a lot of really heterogeneous or summarize a lot of quite complex heterogeneous information in answering some fairly simple questions. So what we have here is a picture of uh, it's a sort of classical figure from, from macroecology. It's the species richness of birds as a heat map. And as you can see, there's a very, very distinct pattern, and we don't know what causes it. It's one of the biggest questions we do have in modern ecology. And uh, this um, picture is created with a wonderful package called PlotsJL. So what we do to answer these questions is that we try to get together information from lots of different uh, places. This is me just last month in Tanzania using a LiDAR device to try to measure the complexity of this forest in the Tanzanian mountains, catching birds and uh, tagging them. But we're also incorporating information. We're based at the museum, so we're incorporating uh, information from existing specimen traits of species. We're incorporating phylogenetic information. We are incorporating satellite maps, large-scale maps. This is of uh, precipitation. And um, then we're, of course, using Julia. And, or I should say, I mean, pretty far along the way, we're using R. We, I'm, I'm personally trying to do most in Julia, but R really, really owns this field. I don't think many of my colleagues have ever heard of other programming languages than R. So, um, so that's, that's, that's where we're currently at. What are the big challenges when we're doing something like that? Well, we're working with all these different data sources. So how do we keep all of this together? How do we make it make sense in our computer together? And then also the computational ecosystem is quite fragmented. And I think that's the thing that characterizes several scientific fields, that they exist at a level way above the level of organization of a package, but way below the organization, uh, the level of, of the language. So if you go to CRAN, they have these uh, task views, you'll find there's 108 packages for environmental analysis, 180 for spatial analysis, 120 for phylogenetic analysis. I'm sure at least half of them are highly relevant for my work. None of them use the same types, none of them talk to each other. So if you want to do something, you, you, you just got to, okay, try to, to, to get them, stick them together. This is just all the packages that are for environmental analysis. My hope is that Julia can help start addressing this. First and foremost, it's an opportunity to start afresh and rethink what it, how we want this package ecosystem to be. <laughs> and then I think I want to highlight that what makes Julia special, we always talk about the speed, but it's not just the speed that makes Julia special. It's the primacy of user types. It's the fact that it makes it easier for us to express abstractions that allow us to think like the scientists we are, and that those abstractions are fast. And so if we can define some abstractions that are useful and that people can agree upon, then suddenly we can, in a broader context, use the language as a way to think and analyze uh, about our science together. 
And also Julia has something we shouldn't underestimate that has a very strong collaborative culture based on GitHub. That's not true for R in many of the older languages. And it's a very big advantage of Julia. However, in practice, it's often worse in Julia because there are so many type, the type system is so rich. Whenever I want to use four different Julia packages, uh, I mean, 80% of my code is always trying to get it to, from one function into the next function. And then the function itself is easy to run. As an example, we already have four different phylogeny packages. They do very different things. None of them are complete. At least the people behind talk together. So let's see something, something good might happen. But we definitely not at this point solved the issue of ecosystem cohesion. So what we should have is a standard. I need to show this down here. In academia, you have to show this XKCD if you mention the word standard. Um, but what we actually really need and we can have is a uniform representation. There's a uniform representation of a phylogeny. There's a uniform representation of uh, lots of things. And for instance, in geography, everybody, was that a two minute or five minute? Four minutes, perfect. <laughs> for instance, in geography, it's completely uncontroversial. Everybody agrees on the same abstractions throughout geography. They've been really good at that. Okay, we have a shape file, there's a point file, we use the GDAL and so forth. In, but uh, whenever you have a field where there isn't like standards, people say, no, no, it'll never work. Uh, so what do we do when we want to create a framework that everybody can use, but also needs it to fit everyone? Because everybody wants their own. I think also actually, in Julia, I think it's fair to say that many of us are only here because we are going to, we are going to say, no, no, we, want, we know this way it's better than, than what all you other people tell me I should use. Um, so as a format for this, I think we can use shared interfaces. That's very good. That's the sort of the canonical solution. It also has some problems. I think an even better solution could be at this point to talk to each other. So that's what we're trying to do, both of these approaches in EcoJulia. So currently it only has like these three packages, spatial ecology, GBIF and EcoBase. That's what I'm going to be talking about. GBIF is essentially a library to download data from the GBIF. And uh, these are the people who are involved apart from me. And they also have some packages that are not currently residing in the organization, but they use the infrastructure from the organization like ecological network, Richard Rees diversity package. And for instance, the microbiome package, which is an interesting thing. It's, some, it's about looking at the human microbiome in test tubes. And uh, uh, so Kevin works with that and he was able to just use the spatial ecology types and implement his package as a very, very thin layer, even though it's a completely distinct branch of, uh, of biology. But it's very ecologically based, but still I think it's interesting. So the first thing we're doing is this interface so we've developed the EcoBase interface together with uh, Richard Reeve. And it's just, it's so abstract, we're only talking about things and places. I mean, we couldn't even agree on something sort of more firm to call it. But it means that it still creates an abstract interface that will take you very, very far in terms of using the objects that we're defining in the EcoJulia package and define new methods for them and for your own package, and they'll all work together. Uh, it also allows users to shift implementation and so forth. So it's a very sort of good entry level thing. The, there's a problem with it, and that is that it, if you don't have a concrete implementation, it's very hard for you to, um, to make it more efficient. So that's where we have the spatial ecology package. The spatial ecology package brings together information on, on what we call species or sites. Those things are in relation to each other, so species occupy sites. For sites, we have the spatial information and we have the site data. For species, we have their traits. And then we have all kinds of interactions among species like the ecological interaction and the evolutionary relationships. I will argue that there are very, very few data sets in ecology that you cannot describe within the context of this uh, framework. And the nice thing about having it in a framework like this is that we can apply what we call the split apply combine approach to analyze them. So we'll take out a subset of that framework do an analysis on it, put it back together, and everything is kept nicely aligned for you uh, when you analyze it. So for instance, if we want to ask, does forest complexity lead to more diversely adapted species? We can add forest complexity and environmental data to the objects, and then for each site, find which species occur, identify their traits, summarize them in terms of diversity and related. So this is ecological talk. This is how you think about it normally in your head. 
how you do this approach. In spatial ecology, you can express exactly that. You add the traits, and then for each site, you create a view, and then you just, and that view automatically just takes out the species that occurs in this site and finds their trait and summarizes them, and poof, you have the result. Everything is kept together. So in four or five lines of code or three lines of code, you've actually made the entire analysis. We're now building iterates as a review, so in the future you can just write this. I don't know if it's clearer though, but it's shorter. And then there's some talk about why, uh, technical talk about these views and all the things we plan to do in the future. And these are all the, the packages that we are currently planning in, in EcoJulia. Matrix randomizations is used throughout ecology. Glue packages to the multivariate statistics package. Uh, spatial phylogenetic regression packages and species distribution models. And the nice thing is that all of these can be extremely thin wrapper packages to well-functioning Julia packages that already exist, making for a coherent package ecosystem. Thanks. <laughs> Do we have time for a question, Chris? Yeah, we have time for a question. So, Michael, have you had a chance to use any um, ArcGIS or, or just kind of software in, in some of your work? Uh, sure. Um, okay. And uh, how often have you have you found that, um, that there's there's only the ArcPy package for the the GIST software? Have you have you found it a challenge to sort of um, use GIST software and then come to Julia because you know they're completely standalone ecosystems? I, well, I tend to, to prefer to do everything in the programming language. R is a very good GIS. Julia is getting there. There's a very, very good organization called Julia Geo, but it's a big thing to, uh, to, to build geographical uh, uh, support. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I've no doubt it's, it's coming, also supported by the GDL, which is cross-platform. So I would never, ever touch ArcGIS again. I don't see, see the reason to do that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.